I'm very lucky that I, I'm able to, to work on several different things you know, at all times. It's never just one thing. And I, I was a little bit afraid back then that horror might be the only thing I might be doing for the rest of my career. But thankfully, I was able to, to break out of that. And now it's a very diverse, different um, environment for me. And I get to do different things every day. My name is Frederick Wiedman. I'm the composer of the Netflix show The Dragon Prince, currently streaming on Netflix. Also the composer of several DC animated movies such as Batman Hush, Death of Superman, Justice League Flashpoint Paradox, and also movies like Tremors, Jarhead, and Doom Annihilation. Uh, when I was, I think, 18 or so, um, I started to play jazz guitar. And when you learn jazz, you really dive into music theory very deeply. And that started to awake the, the, the urge to compose music. Because when you really get in, under the hood of music and you start to analyze it, rather than just playing it, um, it it's just opening a whole new world in a, from a musical perspective. And that's when, that's when I started to actually compose myself. And then the next moment that um, steered me in that direction was the neighbor of my girlfriend back then, he was a film composer who was very successful in, in Germany, in that little town that I lived in, that actually was a film composer, believe it or not. It was very funny. So um, his name is Nick Reich, and he still works on a lot of German stuff and is a fantastic composer. And he let me hang out in his studio a fair bit back then. And so I, this was my first experience to see somebody actually do the craft. And I think that was the, the moment when I've really decided this is what I need to do with my life. And from that point on, um, that's really the only thing I have pursued in my whole life. I, I immediately knew that this was what I wanted to go to college for. I find it like, so, you know, some people get intimidated by things that they don't think they can do or have never done before, but I kind of get excited and to study and to learn on how to do that and how to, how to accomplish these sounds and really start to listen to these artists and figure out, okay, how do they mic the kick drum? How do they compress the kick drum? How are the guitars pan to get the sound? I really get excited about getting into that and, and learning new things. Like I just did a film called um, Bulletproof 2, a sequel to Adam Sandler's Bulletproof, which came out many, many years ago. And this, the temp was all over the place. It was Latin, there was salsa, there was hip hop, there was sort of heisty bad boys type of music. So it was all over the place um, in terms of genre, in terms of style and also you know, ethnic uh, influences. And it's something I have never done before, but I just ran with it and started to study every little bit of music that they had put in the temp and that the filmmakers responded to. And, you know, surrounded myself with the right musicians to perform all that in the most authentic way. And yeah, it came out great. It was a really fun project. I think every piece of music is different from the other one and, and in terms of where it's from, where it's originated from in terms of the style and how it's produced. So that was a very, very diverse, cool project for me to work on. I wanna talk about a piece of music that was a very important cue in The Dragon Prince, the show we just released season three on Netflix. Um, but what, what you're seeing here is, is pretty much just the orchestral mock-up, the synth-only version that was presented to the producers. The way I usually start to write is, first of all, I will go up here and I'll make markers for everything that I need. And often I don't even name them because I can see what's happening on screen. Sometimes I, I write things like, uh, where was it here? Oh no. So you can see something bad is happening right here. Here needs to be a new idea. Here they're running. There's a sting. Right here needs to be quiet. And you know, the, these markers are really for my own purpose. I don't uh, share these with anybody. That's just for my own little bubble here where I work. So that's why some of the descriptions is, is something only I will understand. But that's basically the first step, is to lay out the piece and also decide when I'm going to finish it. Um, where does the new piece, the next cue, begin in this timeline? In this case, I decided to opt out at, at bar 89, and that's when I would continue the next cue, which would be 1M13, since this is called 1M12. And uh, you can see the tempo changes several times, and this is very common in animation because things move very quickly. You have you have a beat and it goes right to the next beat and then right to the next beat. So there is very little time to hold on to much at all, um, which requires you to do some heavy adjustment on tempo just to make sure you can 
seamlessly segue from this moment into this moment into this moment while making it feel like a cohesive piece of music without sounding Mickey Mousey. That's something uh, a, lot, a lot of filmmakers are very um, allergic to because especially in, in a kind of an epic, dramatic show like this, you don't want to ever sound like Carl Stalling or anything like that. So you have to be very cautious of not making it sound like um, a Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck type of thing where you're hitting everything and the music sounds too Mickey Mousey. So that's what I have to be very careful of. Also use the Requiem Choir from Sound Iron heavily, especially on the Dragon Prince. I'm going to show you how I, how, I, how I use it. Basically, I host it in contact like everybody else. And what I generally like to do is I take one contact instance and I load in my legato or sustaining, right followed by the marcado and then the staccato. And I have them all in one thing because I can just very quickly switch these, to these different articulations by using uh, MIDI channels. Now I have this little pad here that switches my input channel. So now I can go channel one, and I have my sustain. If I click channel two, I'm at my marcado choir. And if you see, if I play the same chord repeatedly, it'll cycle through those um, syllables. And, uh, you know, that's, to me, that sounds pretty realistic, especially when you mix it in with the full orchestra um, in the end. Same for staccato. I'll just switch to channel three. So, same idea. And this way I can just quickly hit play and record and just play my choir part, selecting my patches as I go. And it's a pretty fast way to input the data. To hear this in context, I'm going to play this whole, this whole moment right here in the piece. So that was that part. Choir, as you can see, is a big, is a big part of this. Um, and you can see it's throughout this whole cue and many other cues in the show, it's, it's, a, it's used quite a bit all the way throughout. So yeah, score would not be the same without it. Um, I like to surround myself with you know, instruments and things that I can play, even though I'm not a very good uh, performer at specific things. Like I never learned percussion or, or a violin. Um, I've, I did play violin when I was a, a kid until I was about 12 years old, but by no means am I a good player. So I have a dulcimer, a Celtic dulcimer hanging here. It's a beautiful instrument. Um, I use it quite a bit. I layer it often with my other guitars. It has like a, it's almost like a Celtic sound to it, but... But it's, it just sounds really a little ancient, but also can be used in a modern context, I think. In the Dragon Prince, I use it a fair bit because it kind of evokes a Celtic vibe, which is kind of a musical direction we're leaning on towards the elves. So it became a very good strumming quality for those specific characters. And often what I like to do is I take this and I layer it together with this other thing that I love called the seagull. So together that becomes, um, this sounds a little bluegrassy right now, but if you layer it with the other dulcimer, it, it's a really nice organic uh, strumming texture that is, is a little bit more abstract to the ear as a regular acoustic guitar or a steel string guitar. And then this is a really nice Kala ukulele, which also has a, a pickup, which I use quite a bit. So you can plug it in here and then use the DI and add some guitar amps to it, which you can you know, go endless in terms of sounds from that point on. So it's something I love to do as well. Often I'm involved with, um, you know, war movies. A lot of them take place in the Middle East and that's when, when this instrument comes in handy. This is actually a bouzouki, which is a Greek instrument, I believe, but it just 
depending on how you play it, you can you can immediately make it sound Middle Eastern as well. It's also out of tune. Haven't played it in a while. So you get this sort of Middle Eastern sound. Um, also a very unique, cool instrument that even even if it, when used outside of a context like this, you can you can make it work in anything else really. It's it's, it's quite versatile, and uh, thankfully it's got frets like a real guitar. So me being a guitar player, it makes it a little bit easier for me to perform this guy. And then one of my favorite instruments in my studio is is by far the uh, guitar viol. It's a handmade, custom made instrument that I believe only one person in the world makes. He, he lives somewhere, I think, in Los Angeles, and he has a little shop, and he basically makes those, you know, upon custom ordering in them. So you, you get to decide the color, uh, shape, etc. And often you have to wait quite a while for you to get it. I think mine took a few months because he, he literally makes them on order. But it's just an incredible instrument. It's basically fretted like a guitar. So you can play the same chords that you learned on the guitar, um, but you bow it, and you can see the fretboard is slightly arched, kind of like a cello, which enables you to make, you know, to, to use the bow to, to play melodies and and things like this. But at the same time, you can you can just finger it like a regular guitar, and you could pluck it with your fingers or over the pick. Yeah. So what I what I like to do is I just I I take it fairly organically and just plug it in without much of a guitar amp or anything on top. I kind of like the raw DI sound that I get from this. And uh, yeah, so I'm not the best performer at this and often I need many takes, but... So it's really cool, cool instrument, very unique sounding, almost like a steel cello or something like that. But often uh, people don't even know what it is. They just like it. And, you know, then I have to explain what it, where, where the sound came from. Here, what's great is up here, the frets disappear into the fretboard right here. It's just a blank surface. So that enables you now to do, you know, the, the, the creepy stuff like... You know? Slowly bending notes for horror movies, perfect. Um, so anyway, lots of lots of opportunity with this instrument for sure to be creative and come up with new unique things. A huge fan of electronic music, and I have a whole bunch of soft synthesizers that I are my go-to guys. Um, but you know, occasionally the hardware synth is uh, is needed. So I have my Moog Sub Thirty Seven that is always plugged in and ready to go. I love what some of the synth drums in there are just fantastic and beautifully analog sounding. Um, yeah, no, it's just a nice little thing to have around in case you really need that low bass that sets that really saturated electronic analog sound from something. That's that's where this guy comes in super handy. And then I have a bunch of percussion things. This is a Korean book, is what it's called. Um, it's kind of like a taiko, but smaller. And it really has a nice sharp sound that is uh, really nice to be layered with regular, like a Taiko um, patch from, from those sample libraries. If you put that on top, if you just perform a few layers of a live thing on top of regular Taikos, you get a really cool, real sounding um, energy from that. It's, it's nice, like this one layer of performance just gives it this feeling of, uh, of it was really all performed in one studio. Here is um, another instrument, the emotional piano, that I also, love very much. Like I mentioned, I like that you can adjust the pedal volume. It's, it can be, here, here it is. You can hear it a little bit. That's, that's the sound that often added to a piano performance. It, it just immediately makes it sound more real. If you go for, for that sound of something that is supposed to be live recorded. Um, a lot of sample libraries don't have that noise. And so you get this very extremely clean piano. <clears throat> which doesn't really work in your favor because it almost sounds too clean and pristine that at the end of the day, it's, it, it makes it sound artificial. So that's what, that's what this is really great at. In this particular cue, I think the, uh, the piano is playing just a few very soft notes at very low velocities.
Like to me, that's a very tender sound. And as you can see, I'm not even quantizing those just to give it this extra bit of hu human feel that this particular moment in this show really needs. It's a, it's a very emotional moment where um, <clears throat> our main character thinks he's about to lose the love of his life and because uh, she's plummeting to her certain death. So it needed to be very intimate and very personal, which is why this instrument is absolutely perfect for that. Um, and I also like to use the Valhalla reverb, the big Taj room that I that I am absolutely obsessed with, because it makes it very spacey and kind of glassy without muddying it up. Even though the reverb tail is extremely long, yeah. So that's that's another nice little tool that I use. So you just. It just kind of rings out for a very long time, and but it it starts to disappear once you play new notes, and that, and so it doesn't always create a whole lot of um, an overtone cluster on top of the clean piano, which is really important. So it just it just kind of hangs there in space, and. So anyway, big fan of that. Of that combo, Valhalla and the emotional piano. Um, yeah, all the time, right? That's the way to go. So maybe I'll just play this whole piece now so you guys can hear it in context with the choir and the piano in there. What do you think? Sound a good idea? Great, here you go. Strings-wise, I have you know, multiple libraries layered together, but what I sometimes do that really adds a nice quality to the sound is adding some of the Spiccato Hyperion strings from Sound Iron on top of the um, other ones that I have, as well as the sustaining legato ones, because they have a nice deep um, bite to them. Here, I'm going to isolate that for you right now here. This is a very nice... Like I, I like the the bow sound you hear in those. So so those combined with my other ones. It... All right. So I'm using here the mod wheel again to change. Um, dynamics as the notes sustains, which is great to do because that 
that's really what gives it a human touch. And then same for um, staccato. Here I have the um, with the key switch. I'm switching to the spiccato 30 second down uh, that dynamic patch right here. And that together with my other usual suspects is, is, is a nice meaty quality. This is then play together. All right, so again, I think what's what I love about this is the bow sound that's part of the sound that is feels very edgy and and also pokes through nicely in the mix. So that's a it's a good way to do it to use it for layering like this. Thank you. 